<clears throat> then if um, there's anything we talk about that you want to come back to, you can always you can always do that. Okay, so let's just talk about a couple of things here related to um, some of the information in chapters one, two, and three. And uh, we'll start here with chapter two. And there's a bunch of stuff in here on the basics of, uh, of some, some basic chemistry and forms of energy and things like that. But I wanna skip ahead to the laws of thermodynamics. Um, that, you know, and just looking at past AP tests, for some reason, this is a topic that <clears throat> the AP folks like to bring up and test you on. And so I wanna go over the first two laws of thermodynamics with you, uh, but then also sort of explain why they're important and how we're going to use them. And so the first law of thermodynamics um, is one that I'm guessing most of you have experienced somewhere in your lives already. And it basically just states that the amount of energy in the universe is constant, okay? so. Energy is never created nor destroyed. It just changes from one form to another. So when we talk about a power plant, um, like in downtown Madison, creating the electricity that we use in our homes, et cetera, you know, we, we sometimes speak of that in terms of the creation of energy. But in reality, all we're doing is changing one form of energy into another. And in most cases, in this area of the world, we're changing either coal or natural gas energy stored in those bonds into um, an energy that is usable for us electricity. Okay, but the important thing for the first law is to understand that we're never actually creating energy, we're just changing from one form to another. Um, this, by the way, also applies to matter. And sometimes you may have heard it applied to mass. So the amount of matter in the universe is constant and the amount of mass in the universe is constant. The second law of thermodynamics though is important. And this is a more applicable way of thinking of the law of thermodynamics, okay? Um, and that states that while it's true that energy is never created nor destroyed, in the process of converting or transferring energies, sometimes energy is lost that we can use for work. And the reason that this is important is because we can use this to describe the efficiency of our machinery, all right? And so as we are converting one form of energy to another, some of that energy uh, in the conversion is, is lost in terms of usability. In reality, it's not lost, it changes form, but we don't necessarily have a 100% efficiency in the conversion of one form to another. And so one of the things that in the environmental sciences that are discussed very commonly is this concept of efficiency. And uh, right now there's a debate going on, <clears throat> vigorous debate around the efficiency, for example, of automobiles. And is it more efficient to drive an electric vehicle than it is to drive a gas powered internal combustion engine vehicle? And this is an argument that the electric cars are going to eventually win, okay? And so there are some very clear benefits in terms of efficiency the transfer of energy from one form to another when we utilize an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion engine. And we can measure that, all right? Now, one of the things that you see highlighted in this slide is this red arrow uh, described as heat. Heat is very commonly a clue to the efficiency of an appliance or the efficiency of an engine, the efficiency of something that we're using. And very commonly, when you feel um, heat off of one of your devices, appliances, engines, or whatever, 
that heat is a clue to the inefficiency of that device. And uh, that, that can actually be measured as well. Okay, so in, in the back of your head, that's what I want you just to kind of keep in mind as we proceed here through the semester and the year. It's this idea of efficiency. And we know ultimately that energy is never created nor destroyed, but the usefulness is important, okay? All right, so then I wanna skip around a little bit and talk about this concept of open and closed system. This is another idea that you should be familiar with. And it's not complicated. Um, and um, we're going to describe as a system that has inputs and outputs from outside the boundaries of that system. So if we use the earth as an example, here's our nice little split spinning globe. Uh, and we consider the concept of energy. We have energy inputs from outside of the globe, the sun. Okay. So solar radiation enters our system from outside the system. Some of that energy entering our system is absorbed by the planet and then re-radiated -ra uh, back to space, into space. Therefore, the output is outside of our system. Some of that energy is also reflected from the surface and that energy then leaves the system. So in terms of energy, the earth is an example of an open system. Okay, so we have our system here, earth, and we have energy coming in from the outside and we have energy leaving to the outside. When we consider the same system, but we change the variable matter, now we have a closed system. So when we consider the mass of the earth and all the matter on the earth, we generally do not have uh, inputs from outside of the earth. Now that's not 100% true. Occasionally we do have a meteorite a big chunk of rock that's flying through space that enters our atmosphere and does strike the planet. But for the most part, when we deal with matter on our planet, it's, it's matter that is from our planet, stays on our planet and never leaves our planet. So most commonly when we talk about systems, we're gonna be talking about the boundaries between ecosystems, okay? So, and some of those boundaries are fixed depending on the variable, and some of those boundaries are not fixed. So when we talk about the inputs and outputs into ecosystems, sometimes we will consider open systems. Sometimes we'll be considering closed systems. And uh, you should know the difference between those. Just quickly, I wanna consider this last concept today. And that is related to this concept of a negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop. A negative feedback loop, um, you start with some system and there's an input. Uh, that input to the system does not result in a, a, a change to the system. So even though you have an input, the system stays uh, stable. In a positive feedback loop, you have a system, there's an input to the system, and that input leads to a change in the system and that change continues to feed itself. So a quick example of that. Um, if we just consider in this example, lake level. So picture a lake and the lake has a surface and the water that's on that surface evaporates. As the water evaporates, the lake level goes down because you're losing water. But as the lake level goes down, then the surface area goes down, which results in less evaporation. Less evaporation means when it rains, the lake level is going to rise. But when the lake level rises, it's going to lead to more evaporation, which is going to drop the lake level. But when the lake level drops, the surface area goes down, which means there's going to be less evaporation. And this pattern goes on and on and on. So in this particular case, the fact that you have an increase in evaporation actually reduces another part of the system, in this case, surface area, which leads to um, the system essentially going right back to where it started. Now, the opposite of that 
is a positive feedback loop. Imagine a population of people and that population of people starts to go up. You have more people, which leads to more births. But if you have more births, then you have even more people, which means the population is gonna go up even more, which means now you have more people that can give birth, increases the population. So in this example, the population is not going to return to its original number. It's going to continue to rise and rise and rise and rise. This is a positive feedback loop. Another example of this applied to the met very quickly. We know that the uh, ice caps are melting. So as the earth warms, the ice caps melt. But when the ice caps melt, less solar radiation is reflected and more solar radiation is absorbed. But if more solar radiation is absorbed, then the climate warms even more. Warming climate melts more ice caps. More ice caps melt, which means even less solar radiation is reflected, more is absorbed, which even warms the atmosphere more. And so again, that's a feedback loop that builds on itself versus returning back to a, um, the original state. So this concept of a negative feedback loop and a positive feedback loop, you should have an understanding of both of those as well. Okay, so...